Well, the question before us this evening is, what must I do to be saved? And have I done enough? And to answer that, we're going to read from Acts 16, where we have that question asked by a Philippian jailer. Acts chapter 16, we'll just read the verses. Paul and Silas find themselves in the jail and the prison at Philippi, and this records the conversion of the Philippian jailer. And as they are in the prison, there's an earthquake. Verse 25, and at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. An unusual thing to do in prison, isn't it? But they were Christians, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loose. The keeper of the prison, awakening out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straight way. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Just a few weeks ago uh, in September, it was the 19th anniversary since the Twin Towers came crashing down on that uh, fateful morning in New York. Uh, just visiting the uh, exhibition there at Ground Zero, it interested me just to see how uh, those who were alive after the disaster and who managed to get out, uh, just how they were described. Uh, and their categories. They were uh, the people who got down the stairs and out of the building. Uh, they were described as those who were survivors. But then there were another group of people, and really the title that could be written over them were those that were saved. You see, there was a difference. There were those who managed to get out themselves, but there were those who were who were just trapped. And they required someone else to just help them and bring them out. Such was the man, he was called Wills Carruthers. And he was a young investment banker. And he worked up on the 104th floor for a, a small but successful investment bank. And uh, just when the, the plane hit and the first explosion took place, that man began to to help others to vacate the building. But there was something very unique about that young man, Wells Carruthers, and it was this, that people noticed in the workplace every day, he, he, he had a red bandana. And apparently it was his father who had given it to him when he was younger, and he said, son, keep that red bandana with you every day, because there's some day that you might need it. Well, he never thought that this is why he would need it. The remains of that man, Wells Carruthers, were found just in the lobby of the South Tower, just alongside a group of firemen, just a few feet from the front door. He was found six months after the, uh, the impact, and they reckoned that he probably could have made it out, and the reason that his remains were there is because he was helping others, which we now know. Because when the emails began to circulate of those who had survived, first of all, there was a lady, a Chinese lady in a wheelchair who, who gave her testimony of salvation. And she said, I was trapped on the 62nd floor. And with this explosion, I suffered burns. And I was sitting there helpless in a wheelchair. And then I heard a voice of a young man, and he said, just, just come with me. And she said, he already had a woman over his shoulder, but she says, I noticed about him, he had a red bandana over his face to stop the, help him breathe. 
And as the chain of females of survivors went out, uh, the, the relatives of, of Wells Carruthers began to realise that he had saved quite a few. And in fact, by the end of it all, he had saved over 10 people. By the end of it all, they established from witness statements that Wells Carruthers had gone up and down three times from the front door. He could have gone out, but he went back. Why? He said there were others there that needed to be saved. My friend tonight is just a faint illustration. But I want to tell you that the gospel that we preach, it's not the gospel of survival. It's a gospel that saves. Because the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, says 1 Timothy 1 and 15. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save, to save sinners. That's you and me. Oh, John 3 verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world. Why, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, we're not speaking here this evening to condemn you. I hope you realise that. You're condemned already because you're related to Adam, a sinner. No, God sent his beloved son into this world to save the world. Listen to what he said one day. He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. It's a gospel of salvation. What a beautiful word is the word saved. Even a young child can understand that it means to be rescued, rescued from danger. And that's what I want to just highlight here from this passage. Three things, three great dangers that you need to be saved from. You need to be saved from being shut out of heaven because of your sin. Well, those people in the Twin Towers, their salvation was getting out. Your problem is you're going to be shut out. You need to be saved. And then you need to be saved from missing out on, on salvation. We have a wonderful saviour, you know. Uh, he's a great saviour and I love him dearly. And I would wholly recommend him to you. Don't miss out on salvation. It will be the best thing that you've ever done to put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Not only for eternity. It's not just a fire escape from hell, but just to have a saviour. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. We often sing that. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, the danger of missing out. Don't you miss out on God's salvation. I want to end with a note of warning. You need to be saved because you're in danger of being cast out. Should you cross the borderline into eternity without Christ as your saviour, to appear at the great white throne judgment at the roll call of the Bema and the great white throne and your name not found written in the book of life, it will be to be cast out into the lake of fire, into outer darkness, says the scriptures. Oh, the need to be saved. Can I ask you just now, are you saved? When were you saved? How were you saved? Are you sure that you're saved? Because the great danger could just be for you like this man. He, he realised that he was going into eternity and he asks this question, what must I do to be saved? And by the answer that he receives, it's very clear that this man was not referring to the salvation of his job. It's very obvious from this chapter that this jailer was not referring to the salvation of his reputation. No, he realised he was going out into eternity. In fact, he thought death was maybe a good way out. Mind you, that's a terrible thing. Had he taken the route of death, all that he would have done is landed in eternity and hell quicker than he would have realised. Wasn't it good that he asked that question? He realised he needed to be saved. He realised that there was something that was going to hinder him from ever being right with God in heaven. And you need something too because you're not right with God. And my friend, it's just like the jailer and every other person who is saved throughout the ages of history. Because remember, the day and the age in which we live in is the age of grace and the day of salvation. That's why the Lord Jesus hasn't come back yet. He's waiting for more people to get saved saved because he wants nothing more than for you to be saved and for boys and girls to be saved maybe I'm just speaking to some boys and girls teenagers students at university you've just started freshers week and you've just done a few weeks in your course and you realize 
with all the entertainment and pleasure and the drinking and all that your friends are enjoying, there's something missing. Could I tell you what it is? You're not saved. And you need to be saved because you are disqualified from heaven. Your sin renders you guilty. The whole world is guilty. And God, he loves the sinner, but you know he hates your sin. And as I look over my life, I know he hated my sin too. But I'm thankful I can look to Calvary's cross. And I'm thankful that upon that cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, he bare my sins in his own body on the tree. Who his own self, says Peter, bare our sins in his own body on the tree. You say, you're back at the cross again. Of course I am, because it's the only answer to our sin and your sin and mine. Why? Because upon the cross is a sinless man. That's why the answer to this man's danger of being shut out of heaven was a man who came from heaven and went back into heaven and in between he went to the cross and he paid the price for our sins upon that tree, gave himself a ransom for all and all my sins were laid upon him. Jesus bore them on the tree. God who knew them laid them on him. Unbelieving, I go free. Do you see the truth of the gospel? Your sins are taking you down to hell. God doesn't want you to be there. That's why he loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so what is it that this man needs? Listen to the lovely reply when he asks, what must I do to be saved? Go to church? No. Go and sign up for a degree in theology? No, that was no use to this man. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You say, Jonathan, well, what does it really mean to, to believe? You know, there's people struggle with uh, believing. Indeed, just yesterday I was talking to a young uh, Muslim and as we were sitting having coffee, uh, interested in salvation and the scriptures, he said, but Jonathan, he says, I don't really understand just what it means to believe. And I said, well, why is that the case? He says, well, you see, the difficulty is in my religion, believing and becoming just a member of this religion, he said, it's just about reciting a few lines. And he says, as long as you recite those lines, then you're in. He says, that's what believing means. Oh, I said, oh, I said, I can answer you the, the question you're answering, you're asking. You see, when it comes to the gospel, saved and salvation is not through reciting it's through relying have you got that i'll say that again salvation through jesus christ is not about reciting the word of god or saying a verse or saying a prayer it is relying upon a person you see that's what that's what salvation is relying upon a person you know wells or others as he made his way down the stairs of the South Tower, he had, a, he had a woman just over his shoulders. And he carried her right to the bottom so that she could get outside. That woman, as she looked at Wells Carruthers, if you had said to her, excuse me, that, that man has saved you. Yes, he has. And what did you have to do for him to save you? What do you think she would have said? She would have just said, I really didn't do anything. I just had to trust him that he would carry me down and that he would save me. I would just have to rely upon him. My friend, can you not see that that's what you need to do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ is relying 100% upon him. It's getting your eyes off yourself because when you look at yourself, all that you'll see is a failing sinner. It's getting your eyes off even Christians because you could trust them. They'll let you down, myself included. Ah, but you trust the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, thou shalt be saved. Now, why does it say that? It says that because it's Christ who does the saving. You see, that's why when we ask this question, have I done enough? The answer to it is not, have you done enough? The answer is, did Christ do enough? Now, could I ask you that? Because you'll never be saved until you get your eyes fixed on Calvary and realise this. He died for me. And when he died for me, he's done enough. 
How do I know that Christ did enough on the cross? How do I know that he shouldn't have suffered a few hours more? How do I know that all my sins were laid upon him? Do you know how I know? Because on the third day he rose from the dead. Death couldn't hold him. Why? Because God was so satisfied with the work that he did on the cross. God accepted the payment and it was sufficient so that on the third day he could rise from the dead. And then what did he do? He went back to heaven and says the book of Hebrews, this man after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down at the right hand of God. You know, I go around sometimes into church buildings in London or Oxford yonder, just to have a look at the architecture. And you know, quite often I see a little man at the front. And you know, he's busy doing this and he's lighting a candle here and he's, he's getting something ready here and he's busy. And you know, I'm thankful when it comes to my salvation. It's not based on a man in a church doing work. I'm not depending tonight upon a priest or a pastor or a preacher. No, I'm depending on a man who's in heaven who sat down. The reason he sat down is his work is finished. Can you not rely upon him? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. My friend, if you don't rely upon him, then you're shut out of heaven in your sins. It's as simple as that. And if you don't rely on him, you're going to miss out on him as saviour. You're going to miss out on him as your great high priest, the one in heaven who can help you. And the one in heaven who has saved you. And the one in heaven who will bring you safely through death to heaven on the golden shore when life is over. Would you not like to know him as saviour? I tell you, he's a real saviour. You know, people... They argue with me sometimes and they say, I want to debate the existence of God. I'm not really interested in debating whether God exists or not. I know he, he exists. Why? Because I know him personally as Savior. I speak to him every day. And I know he's my Savior because he lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great thing to be saved and have your sins forgiven. Not to have the guilt of your sins when you go to sleep at night and think, my, am I going to have to face God someday with all that I have done? And you know, we're quite good at saying our good works will be offered to God. Listen, the fact of the matter is, if our good works and our bad works were all lined up, do you know what I believe? My bad works, I tell you, they would vastly outweigh any little good that I had done. Do you know why? Because anything that I bring to God, the Bible says, is just like filthy rags. Even the very best that I could gather up that I've done in my life. Even the very kindest things that I have done that I can remember. And mind you, there may be not too many. If I was to bring the very best that I have... Jonathan Black on his very best day presented to God. Do you know what the problem is? There's just a big thumbprint of sin on my soul. And that's why you need a sinless saviour. Or you're shut out of heaven. That's why the Saviour is so wonderful, because he is sinless and will be for all eternity. He's a holy man and will be forever. And I'm thankful that the psalmist, you know what he says in, 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 in Psalm 32, he says, Happy is the man whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Are you trying to cover your own sin? I tell you, come to Christ. And he will cover your sin forever. Why? Because he shed his precious blood. And 1 John 1 and 7 says, It's the blood of Christ, his son that cleanseth us from all sin. It's salvation and being shut out. You need to be saved because the danger is you could miss out. But the third thing is just a very solemn thing. And this is, it's the danger of being cast out. Because should you cross the line, John 3.36 says this, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And Revelation 20 and 15 says this, that whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Why? 
Not just so much because of all your sins. No, the greatest sin of all is just to reject Jesus Christ as Saviour. Because can I tell you, as those people in the Twin Towers heard that voice of Wells Carruthers saying, Come with me. There's a man stands tonight and he's not wearing a red bandana, but he's nail prints in his hands and feet. Do you know what he says? Come unto me, all ye that labour, and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And he says, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. I tell you the danger of being cast out if you're not saved. But the absolute guarantee that the moment you trust Jesus Christ, you have a rock-solid guarantee. Him that cometh to me, I will never, in no wise, at any time, in any place, for all eternity, I will not cast out. That's how I know I'm saved as I stand speaking to you this evening. Because Christ tells me he will never cast me out. And I trust the man of Calvary with all my heart. I trust the man who rose from the dead. My full confidence is in Christ. What must I do to be saved? This jailer asked. He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The two of those prisoners in unison with full agreement. They pointed him to Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he did get saved. And you know, it wasn't long before there were others in his house believed. You know, if you got saved, you know, you could bring salvation to others too. And I love what it says. He brings these two prisoners into his house. There's a change has taken place. And you know what it says? It says that he rejoiced. Salvation makes a person happy. doesn't mean you'll never have trouble or sorrow in your life or difficulties. But you know, we have a deep peace and a deep joy. It doesn't change with circumstances. It doesn't change because your football team loses at the weekend. That's emptiness. Oh, salvation brings security. Salvation brings satisfaction. And from being a guilty, empty sinner, you become full of the joy of Christ and the Lord. What must I do to be saved? I say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And have I done enough? You don't need to do anything because it's based on one who did everything. Just accept him. Accept the gift. I seek no other argument, says the hymn writer. I want no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. May God save you and may God bless you. Thank you for listening.